Revolution Radio proudly presents, live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia, it's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Join Bernard as he shares topics that reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience, including world liberty, the esoteric, suppressed technologies, spiritual ascension, and human consciousness. Humanity has awakened, and our time has come to realize our full potential. And now, live from the Star City, your host, Bernard Alvarez. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend, uh, James Swagger. Uh, for those of you... Uh, that do not know. He has been on the show with us many times before. He is an author and researcher as well as uh, the radio host uh, and owns, uh, of course, his own uh, internet radio show, Capricorn Radio. He is also working on a documentary series, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, James was stranded in, um, in Liverpool, and he's kind enough to be joining us live from uh, the Liverpool um, waiting area as he waits for his ferry to take him home. Hello, James. Welcome back to the show. How are you today besides traveled? <laughs> hey, Bernard. Great to talk to you again. It's great to be on the show again. And uh, I hope there's not too much background noise here. It's getting a little bit noisy, but uh, glad to be here. Glad to be on the show. Glad to be back. Well, we're very glad to have you back on the show. Now, um, you're you're mostly known, at least to me and my friends, as as the guy who wrote the the serious, uh, the New Grain serious book. Uh, you've always been involved with um, the Passage Graves, as well as other megalithic structures, and now you're going to be moving on to doing this uh, wonderful series that looks like a great series. Uh, about um, the megalithic cultures and the megaliths of the world, quite honestly. Uh, sure. What, what, can you give us a synopsis of, of the work? That you're yeah. Doing? Um, well, uh, the documentary I'm working on is eight parts, uh, season one. It will probably go to season two, but initially, uh, eight parts, season one. Uh, it's called Megalithic Odyssey, uh, Gods, Myths, and Men. And, uh, you know, the aim of the documentary is to get the information that I've researched that I can put in books. There's a lot of stuff. There's a very specific individual pieces of data here and there and scattered across Europe that I found on my journeys and my travels and my research. And I just think it's incredibly important uh, material. But it, unless you categorize it or put it in a book for a reason, uh, you know, it, it gets lost. And the best way to present some of this material is uh, via a documentary. Um, so that was the number one aim, is to synthesize a lot of uh, data out there. Um, but I have got an Irish host and I've got an English host, that's Thomas Sheridan and uh, Maria Wheatley. I know Maria's been on the show with you many times, yeah. uh, Bernard. She's a great, great, great researcher and she's a credit to the megalithic field of research. She really is. And uh, uh, so we're, we're going to be covering not just the British Isles, um, but Predominantly, there'll be a large focus there because of the large quantity of monuments, but we are going to hit every country in Europe. We're going to go to get to every megalithic region. Maybe not all in season one, but for the best part, I think we're going to cover up quite a lot of it. And we're going to try and synthesize the data. We're going to try and synthesize the research that's out there uh, to show the commonalities, to show what's uh, linking certain sites to each other and what's different as well and why they're different. Um, we're going to address every question that's out there. We're going to get into alternative theories, um, so we have a mammoth task, I mean, to, to get to every country, I mean, if you go do a documentary on Egypt or you go and do a documentary on a, on a certain place, that's pretty easy to do in terms of infrastructure and, you know, financing, because you're going to one locale. Um, but the problem with the megalithic region of Europe is you're, you're looking at about 18 countries, Bernard, uh, from Scandinavia right down to the Spanish islands off the coast of the west of Africa, uh, Palma being Pacific, but um, we got from Malta to Northwest Ireland. So there's a lot of terrain to cover, uh, but it's necessary and we're, we're going to do it. It's necessary to, to synthesize all this and uh, it's a massive undertaking. Um, we're already underway with it um, and we're already getting great results. So I think we've got four film shoots. We're doing a film shoot every month. We've got four underway and we've got about eight to go. So. 
hopefully that will just describe a little bit about it. Wow. Well, it sounds like a very big undertaking, and, and I thank you for doing that because, I mean, just looking at the outline of the uh, of the documentary, the idea of so many countries, uh, not only that you're going to visit, but the idea that so many countries and regions had these megaliths and these me megalithic cultures was, was actually quite new to me. Uh, I was yeah. very surprised about that. Uh, how, how far does this megalithic culture span? Well, in geographic latitudes, you're talking half the northern hemisphere. Uh, I don't mean that, no joke. I mean, from literally from the northern latitudes of Norway, about latitude 68, we have standing stones up as far as there. And down as far as, like I mentioned, uh, in the islands of Tenerife, um, there's rock art there, incredibly uh, significant. It's almost identical to the stuff in Northern Ireland, telling us that whoever put the stuff in, in the Tenerife Islands also put it in um, uh, Northern Ireland too. Um, so the rock art down there is about latitude, must be 22, something like that, 22 degrees. So you're looking at about 45 degrees of latitude, which is half the Northern Hemisphere. Now, if you want to take from Northwest Ireland to probably even Israel, if you want to ca calculate Israel, because there's dolmens there too. So the, the, the span of this megalithic culture um, I'm not even sure it's right to call it the one group of people. That may have been the individual tribes, and I say the word tribe, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I mean, there may have been interbreeding between different tribes and different ideas. So we also we kind of see an amalgamation of uh, architecture and uh, philosophies and ideas even within the megalithic culture. Some people refer to them as the beaker culture. Um, that's not entirely true either. Some when you come to Ireland, it's a very special case because we have. Uh, what we we have an Irish pantheon of gods, uh, semi-divine gods, who were one 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 group was giants and the other group were a semi-divine uh, mythological god race, if you if you will, um, and they're inherently linked with the megaliths. We know that from the written uh, written accounts. Uh, so there's a lot of material to get into, um, but the aim is of the documentary is to put all this together in a way that's digestible for the public. Um, and I think we can do that. I think it's a massive undertaking, yes, but uh, another aim is not just the countries involved, but to take on a lot of the megalithic researchers like myself out there in the field and synthesize their work too. So there is a lot of alternative theories out there on individual sites, um, but also for earth energies, for example, and the astronomy, um, the acoustics, the shamanism, the practices, the artifacts. And these are the things that we're going to try and get into in each episode. So we've structured season one uh, around taking on each body of knowledge that is encompassed in the megalithic uh, culture. Um, I like to use civilization because they were, a, they were a civilized race, although people refer to them as, you know, Stone Age people, but they were highly sophisticated. We know that time and time again from their body of knowledge that they had, especially the astronomy, um, the sun, the moon, um, star constellations, they had an incredible body of knowledge, uh, you know, and the, the scale of the terrain that we just described, Bernard, that they covered, um, like, I, like I said, I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, covered until the time of the Romans. I mean, the Romans started in Rome, uh, spread like a virus in all directions and encompassed the most of Europe up, to far, up as far as Scotland and, and until the Romans. I mean, no other culture or civilization really you know took on Europe like that um, the Celts did somewhat but the Celts also kind of somehow interlinked with the megalithic people there was a crossover there now when you say when you say the megalithic people and I know it would be different um, depending on the region but can you give us an example of, uh, of perhaps one of the larger uh, megalithic uh, tribes or cultures or whatnot well i say people i mean it, i think tribes is the is 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 is, is probably a more politically correct world because the, the information is changing all the time and like i said maria weekly uh, she's doing a lot of serious research into the tribe at the moment um and there seems to be different types of skulls associated with tribes uh giorgio de Suclis on his uh, one of his latest episodes uh in search of aliens, he went over to Malta and he got his hands on these Maltese skulls that associated with the megalithic builders to found inside the hypogeum. 
Out of 5,000 skulls, only six remain. It's a massive blow to archaeology to have let that happen, but setting the conspiratorial uh, part aside, there is uh, six of those skulls remaining, and they all show an elongation. Um, so oh. the elongation of these skulls are indicative of a different type of tribe. Um, I mean, you have to really define what is, what is people, what is humans. And there may have been a slightly different uh, human genome um, uh, acti activating in Europe at that time. Um, and there may have been an interbreeding um, going on. We actually have that written about in the ancient Irish records, and we have that in the archaeological record as well. So we have this, what's called Irish mythology, with the ancient pantheon of gods showing you that this tribe was warring with this tribe, that's the two of the Danon, was warring with the Fomorians. The Fomorians were known of big stature, men of big stature, i.e. giants. Uh -huh. uh, ironically enough that the Fomorians, the giants, were also, a lot of them were associated with the word Og, uh, which is in the biblical record as Og, the king of Bashan, the giant. So we have place names where, with these megalithic people associated with Og. So we know that the Ogs, Fomorian, the giants, were... Uh, one group of people who are somehow linked with these peoples uh, and tribes that built the monuments, and then we have the two of the Danon, uh, this semi-divine race that seem to be associated with the mounds themselves and, and not the rest of the megaliths. So we may have had a fusing of these two cultures. Now, as well as the records of them fighting each other, we also have records of them intermarrying each other. Um, we go to the archaeological record and we see different types of skulls and bones being found. We have one uh, normal shaped skulls and then we have these uh, elongated skulls or slightly, um, we wouldn't call them like the long cone heads of, 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 of Peru. They wouldn't be uh, typically elongated like that, but they are very long. They're like a long, long shaped or long skulls. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we definitely have in the archaeological record uh, a couple of examples. Um, that there is, uh, you know, different tribes there. Um, so it, it seems to match up with the mythology too. Um, and I think this is where the research is heading, that we have a lot of independent researchers out there, you know, really just putting themselves on the line uh, with their money, their time, their efforts, their, their passions, their goals, and they're trying to all put this data together. And uh, I think the aim of the Megalithic Odyssey documentary is to get these old people into the one group um, and, and have a, like a, a, you know, like a megalithic round table of people presenting their knowledge. And each, each person's uh, research stands to them, to, the, to them, but it, you know, it also provides uh, a window into the megalithic culture that really isn't happening in archaeology. Archaeology just won't touch the astronomy, or it won't touch the acoustics, it won't touch the shamanism. The only thing they want to do is dig up the stones and the bones. And even then, they don't do a good job of that. They, they seem to misplace the artifacts or sometimes, um, you know, just downright, you know, uh, put them in vaults and hide them from public. Well, I, I have to say it's very courageous of you and, of course, all of our other re alternative archaeological researchers out there because you're, you're almost um, rewriting uh, the history that has been generated, you know, through the empirical science uh, community that has uh, has one story and will not deter from that particular mm. story. We are living in a new age, Bernard, and I don't mean yes. that in terms of the definition of new agers. I don't, I'm not that, that that's a derogatory thing either. I mean, we are in a new age, a, an age of enlightenment in terms of research where independent alternative researchers are actually driving the academic fields and it's slowly getting soaked into the academic. It, it's, it's a bizarre, it's like a bipolar way of doing research. It's a bizarre thing that, you know, academia is shackled to the constructs of their own, um, you know, institution that they can't think freely or think outside the box. And if they do, they lose their tenure or positions. And then we have these other people, myself included, that, you know, either from engineering or science backgrounds who have a deep interest in this subject matter, that are able to get out there and not shackle to any institution and free think about what they want and, and to think it's on the box and be okay with it because we don't lose our jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's bizarre. And then we have this 
problem then where we try to fuse the two together. And, and I speak bad of archaeology sometimes, but I also speak good of it too. I mean, Michael J. O'Kelly, for example, who discovered the light box at Newgrange, I mean, credit to him. I mean, we would know about half the astronomy because that discovery of the light box at Newgrange, uh, which is a major spectacle today, 300,000 people come to visit Newgrange every year. That wouldn't be if it wasn't for that discovery. So he was a mainstream academic archaeologist and he had the courageous uh, effort to put that together. As a result of that, people realized how deep the astronomy goes. And now when you have a spectacle that you can go and witness today, um, you now that really speaks volumes for the, the, the uh, ancient astronomers. Um, as a result of that, from the 80s onwards, we had a massive uh, influx of researchers looking into the astronomy and major discoveries. Uh, and they're still coming out of like, I mean, we're still knee deep in it. There's still plenty of stuff to discover out there. There's still plenty of stuff to find. So when was it that, uh, well, actually, let me rephrase that. Uh, uh, you're talking about archaeoastronomy of how they've placed these particular structures mm -hmm. in accordance to to the stars above. Quite honestly, uh, well, stars, sun, and moon. Yeah, I mean, this, the sun and the, the sun is the the big one. I mean, they were solar worshippers. Let's let's figure that one out first. They were solar worshippers. Wow. We have the solar wheel, the eight days of the pagan wheel that goes back to the megalithic culture. I think we covered that on the Halloween show. Mm. Um, and and I've just come back from Avebury for a film shoot. I was doing the. Uh, the Lammas, what people call it Lammas in English fair, or the, the harvest day, the 1st of August, or uh, in Irish we call it the Lunasa, uh, which is basically meaning the 1st of August celebration. And it's the halfway point on the solar wheel. It's the halfway mm -hmm. point between summer solstice and autumn equinox. And when you astronomically measure that halfway point, it's about the 3rd of August, but we round it off to the 1st of August now. But anywhere in that window, and uh, even I, I had a special, special uh, day this year, Bernard, because not only did we have the special solar day of the year, but we had uh, a blue moon as well yes, on yes. that special day. And I managed to get footage of that for the megalithic documentary. And, uh, you know, we had a shamanistic ritual there. Uh, people still ritually use these monuments today. That's what you got to realize. I mean, we had Welsh flutists, we had drummers, um, and we had a, a, a respectful ceremony there. And that was great for me to do that and connect for that as well, as well as shooting it and, and getting it on camera. And of course, watching the moon rise down just as the sun goes down on a blue moon. I mean, this is what these megalithic people did. They respected the sun and they respected the moon. They knew the cycles very, very well. And it wasn't just astronomy. It was a shamanistic, uh, you know, ritual procession that these guys had on these eight days of the year. So the sun was deeply important to them, not just in astronomy. I mean, they were astronomers and shaman, shamans simultaneously, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to to do the research and compartmentalize it in an academic way, which is what I have done. I've looked into the astronomy, I've looked into the acoustics, and I've looked into the earth energies. And now I'm looking into the geometric designs of the hinges. And I, you have to compartmentalize your research. But inherently, the ancient guys, they were polymaths. They were shamans. The shaman polymaths would be what the best way to describe these guys. Mm -hmm. you know, this was just their body of knowledge to these guys. This is who they were. Um, you know, incredibly intellectually highly evolved souls that were putting these monuments together. And, and they left us some wonderful information to figure out. I mean, they left us some really wonderful information. Um, but yeah, the, the stars are, again, this is, this is the one that gets people because that gets people's attention. It's easy for us just to forget the sun and the moon um, in our own daily lives. I mean, who, who looks up at the moon in, in cities like our, unless you, and who looks at the sun anymore? I mean, you know, it's just sitting there every day, unless you're in nature to appreciate these, these beautiful times. But nobody sees the stars in cities anymore. We've lost it as a highly evolved uh, Western civilization. You know, we don't even see the skies uh, in the cities anymore. So, you know, it's, it's, it's when we look at the ancient builders, we look at the, the star constellations and we look at the art that they left us and it matches up with the stars. And then we figure out that they knew about even incredibly longer cycles and they were trying to figure out their own cosmology. And um, just to go back to, to the latitudes, I personally, why I think, and I'm going to roll this out in the documentary with some serious evidence too. I personally think they were up as far as northern Norway because they were figuring out the earth was a globe. They were figuring out that, you know, the further up the globe you, you go, you figure out that the sun uh, is still doing its thing normally, but the moon is very low on the horizon. As you go to the equator, the moon is above you. 
Um, so they were very aware of that. If they were traversing half the northern hemisphere, they knew that the moon was doing strange things. Um, but they could pinpoint that moon anywhere on its metonic cycle. Let's, let's make no mistake about that. We have several monuments that do that. Kalanish being one in the Outer Hebrides of around latitude 60. We have the uh, recumbent stone circles. Uh, these special circles with one altar stone where the moon sits on it, literally sits on it as you look out. It's a, it's a feat of observational cosmology. Uh, that they knew exactly where that moon would be on this metonic cycle, uh, on the lunar maximum, and they would put them moon uh, sitting on a stone. And this again only happens in northern latitudes. Wow. So they knew that this was going on. Again, we look up at the, uh, again, I'm going to show many examples of this, and again, I'm bringing the attention to this material because it's, it's not even done within in, in megalithic circles. Most people never even heard of a court tomb. They only occur in the north of Ireland. Uh, northeast and northwest. There's 300 known examples, a couple of rogue examples down south, but for the best part, they occur over one degree of latitude, uh, that's latitude 55 to latitude 54, uh, across the top of the northeast and the northwest of Ireland. Bizarrely, most of these are aligned to north-south axis. Uh, they're like a long barrow or a long passage tomb with a semicircle on the front of it. And on the semicircle, uh, there's an opening going to north-south. Now, once you have a north-south opening, that gets really lucrative in terms of research because then you realize that it rules out the sun and the moon and they're aligning it to a north-south axis, a north-south polar axis. Oh, wow. um, they would have noticed the sky. Uh, if you look at the North Pole, it stands still and you see that the, the star constellations revolve around it, but you only notice that when you realize there's summer constellations and winter constellations and you're looking at stars over long epochs. You don't notice that throughout the year. It takes you a while to figure that out. But if once you figure that out and you align a monument to a north-south axis and you put a circle there, anything with a circle and it brings the, the horizon down to ground level. And they were able to map that. And I think they were trying to find the North Pole. I think they were pinpointing the North Pole and I think they were trying to find out what was going on with the latitudes. Uh, the moon tells you that. The fact that they could put that moon anywhere and enter their monuments. Carol Keel, again, uh, passage tomb complex in the northwest of Ireland, has another feat of engineering with the moon. The sun comes in through a light box just like Newgrange uh, on, the, on the summer solstice sunset. That's great. That's, that's, that's something we see elsewhere. But the moon also does it every 19 years too. Oh, wow. And again, these guys knew exactly. And, the, and what happens is, because there's a northern latitude, uh, latitude 54, you, what you happens is the moon seems to bob along the mountains on the horizon, and then it's and its moon uh, and its moon set uh, at the lunar maximum comes into the light box. Again, if you were down towards the equator, the moon would be up very high overhead. You couldn't do this. So they were very aware of this material, uh, the, this observational cosmology that they were involved in. Um, they may have actually even sought out northern latitudes to see any other changes. Um, uh, again, you got to understand that they had geometric circles. They had quadrilateral uh, quadrilateral shapes done in stones in Brittany. They were playing around with trigonometric ratios. Now, before you get too excited about sine, cosine, and tangent, and, <laughs> and, and geometric tables with decimal points, these guys weren't working with decimal points. They were working with ratios. So a ratio of three to four. You could have a ratio of three standard lengths to four standard lengths. You could put your trigonometric ratios in, in whole numbers, but have them as ratios. That's the way the Mayans did it. So I have no doubt that these guys had a basic math, at the very least doing some trigonometry. And most likely, I think they could navigate by the moon and certain latitudes. I, I certainly, did they have like a, a number system? I'm not entirely sure, but I think they could find themselves on a, on a percentage of the globe where they knew how far up the globe they were. Or I definitely think uh, at the minimum as crude as that, but maybe even more. That is absolutely fascinating, James. And to figure out, well, A, to figure out that they had this knowledge and B, that they actually had this knowledge is really amazing. Um, we are we are going to be coming up on a break in just one moment. Can uh, we share where people can find more information about this upcoming work? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, well, you can check me out on my Facebook profile. That's where I'm, I'm actually doing some... Uh, um, just some little slow releases of uh, as I go footage, little outtakes, and uh, you know people can catch me there. You can go to jameswagger.com. You can read out everything I do as an author and researcher there. Um, but inherently, uh, I have got the megalithic odyssey uh, book out. I have it. And now back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. 
And welcome back to the Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I just want to remind everybody, if you are interested in, in uh, taking a look at all of the work that I'm doing besides these radio shows, as well as my video series and other articles and classes that I have released to the public, you can find that all at bernardalvarez.com. So on my new website, go take a look. Tell me what you think. Anyway, let's get our uh, let's talk to our friend uh, James Swagger again. Welcome back to the show. I um, we've covered a little bit about um, archaeoastronomy. We've covered a little bit about the cultures. Now I, I know you're going to be talking or, or doing some work as well with the archaeoacoustics, which is, is kind of new to some people. I don't think many people realize what archaeoacoustics is and the fact that these a lot of these uh, megaliths had a sound quality to them. Could you uh, update us a little bit on, on what you have found and, and what is archaeoacoustics? Oh, sure. Uh, me, well, archaeoacoustics is a mixture of archaeology and the field of acoustics. So yeah. it can be the study of acoustics in an archaeological setting. Um, so that could be the study of ancient bone flutes from the Ice Age, or you know, there's many of those from in the region of Austria. It could be the study of an acoustic engineering design to an ancient monument. It could be um, the study of anything acoustics in an archaeological setting. The, the, the branch of archaeoacoustics that I'm particularly interested in is that of the megalithic builders, because inherently, where you find the astro astronomically aligned monuments, you find the acoustics there too. Uh, it's not all just science. I mean, there was a reason why the acoustics is there. And again, that comes back to shamanism. But for the purpose of my research, I do it in a very scientific way. That's the scientist training and the engineering coming out in me. Um, so, what, for example, Stonehenge is an auditorium. You stand in the center of Stonehenge and you, 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 you have a, either a drum beat or a sound. It could be you chanting, whatever. You, from a perimeter outside Stonehenge, you will hear... Uh, an acoustic effect where you'll have an enhancement of that audible tone. Um, that's a very robotic scientific way of explaining it, but that must have been known to the ancients. We know that they shaped the inner horseshoe stones flat on one side and roughly hewn on the outside uh, to enhance that effect. Um, it's not just like that. There's other stuff up in stone circles at the, in the Orkneys. We have Maze Hell Passage Tomb on the island of the Orkneys as well. That has a resonance chamber at four hertz, like a Helmholtz resonator. That's been measured and scientifically doctored um, uh, by Dr. Rupert Till and, and Dr. David Keaton's done all of this pioneering research that I'm talking about. Um, uh, Newgrange is set in the largest natural amphitheater in the world. Uh, it's in that Boyne Valley, and when you beat a drum or anything outside the monument or, or shout, you'll hear that for miles in the valley. So if you can imagine any drum beating coming out that bottleneck chamber, it would just be boom, boom, booming in the valley. Um, wow. So a lot of uh, a, a lot of the monuments, again, the hypogeum, the, the most famous one of all, uh, the acoustically tuning of that monument, which is a Neolithic stroke, megalithic temple uh, underground. Now, the archaeology on Malta does not want to associate Malta with the rest of megalithic Europe, even though they're facing an incredibly damning mounting of evidence that does that. But setting them people, setting that aside, I mean, there's nine points of commonality or something like that that I listed. Um, are strong, definite points of commonality, but they just don't want to know. Um, but setting that aside, the archaeology aside, I mean, you armor, you chant into the Oracle Hall. I got to test it out this year, Bernard. Cool. And yeah, I was actually with a, a tour group. Uh, well, I was with somebody, a girl, and, and there was eight school girls and some tour group there. So I was the only guy or male guy uh, in a group of nine women, and uh, it only activates at the male vocal range. So I got a chance to try it out. I was the only guy there to do it, so I felt very privileged for that cool. one. Uh, yeah, and I could feel the infrasound coming back and hit me in the chest, Bernard. Uh, I only did it for a few seconds, like, but um, so you just give a long arm, and that infrasound will echo around the place and come back and, and whack you in the chest. Some wow. people, I've done infrasound tests now, Bernard, and I found that some this. Two people, uh, two types of people, those that don't like the infrasound and those that actually enjoy it. And uh, there's nobody in between. You either like this stuff or you don't. 
um, it's it's a bizarre. It's like it's either a, it's like somebody's scratching their nails down the blackboard. Somebody somebody shrieks at it, and somebody it doesn't bother. Like you know, mm-hmm. um, you either like it or you don't. Um, but have, make no mistake, this infrasound coming back will affect you. And when you say infrasound, it, it, what what is the characteristic of that? Does it come? It, does it move through your body? Is that what you're saying? So there is a shamanistic reason why they are there, but in terms of my research, that's all I'm interested in is proving the case. Yes, they were acoustically tuned, and not just at one or two locations. I'm trying to unify the monuments because they were clearly, clearly to me, but I have to make that digestible for the public. Clearly to me, they are one culture, but to the archaeologists, they don't want to know. It doesn't seem to even attract them in any way. Uh, they seem to be the Portuguese guys not talking to the Spanish guys, not talking to the Irish guy, oh. not talking to the Danish guy, and, and they're all speaking different languages as well, which doesn't help. It's like a incredibly complex mountain of evidence that's not even been addressed in any systematic way. Um, that, that's my take, though, Bernard. I'm a systems analyst. That's what I do different. I look at the wider, complex problem. I gather all the data and I look for what's the same and then I can say, well, that proves this case or that gives you an insight. That's the perspective there. It's non-negotiable. It leads you to that conclusion, you know, and it's time to wake up, guys, and put this stuff together. And That's my undertaking and, and I have enough of that now to fill at least season one on Megalithic Odyssey and possibly I know, another second season. But uh, I've got some really exciting stuff to roll out and the best way is to present this information is with video. Um, right. And I know put it, putting it in a book, Bernard, I could probably lose some people. Um, so right. that's the aim. That is the aim. Uh, it's a massive undertaking. But I do want to sh- focus on the shamanism too. I mean, the shamanism is the one key thing that ties this all together. Um, and yeah. and it's, great to, it's great to see people out there ritually using these monuments today. And it was great for me to do that in Avery on the weekend. I mean, Avery is like a mecca for people to come to and uh, all sorts of pagans, neo-pagans, Wiccans. And I believe there's a difference. I'm not too sure what they are, but there's a difference between all that group of people. But yeah, I mean, these people, uh, the Druids are still ritually using Stonehenge today. And there may have been a revival there, but they've been always ritually using these monuments, even in megalithic times. From 5000 BC to 1000 BC, they were ritually using monuments and recycling and turning their function into something else. And that's why we see sometimes stone circles turned into passage tombs or passage tombs leveled and recycled into stone circles turned back again. It's a, it's, we, we even misclassify monuments as a result of that. Um, so we know that in ancient times they were being ritually changed and used of their function, sometimes even decommissioned. That's another thing we don't really fully understand about the megalithic uh, cultures, that they decommissioned some monuments after a period of time. Personally, I think that may have been to do with the astronomy. The alignments fell out. Uh, the sun and the moon won't. The sun and the moon will always be aligned uh, when you have them uh, pretty much. I mean, mid range is only off a slight fraction after 5,200 uh, years. Right. But uh, the the stars, they slip quite a lot over 72 years, one degree every 72 years. So, um, the, uh, here's my call to the boat as well. But the problem is, I mean, synthesizing all this data, um, it, that's the difficult thing. But the shamanism is, is a new thing for me to try and tie this all together. And that's where I'm going to be addressing this in, a, in an episode as well, because the shamanism uh, is the one thing that ties it all together. And talking to shamans that are ritually using these today really does give us insight in a practical sense. Now, did, is it fair to say that all of these cultures practice some form of sh- shamanism? They use these uh, these um, megaliths for whether it be uh, inducing states or ritual or. Mm-hmm. Sure, I mean, if, when you go to uh, Fornox, when you go to Fornox uh, passage tomb, the art there is indicative of the the art that the shamans in Peru use today. It's the same zigzag wavy line, same. Uh, Lozenges, the same artwork is pretty much on their clothing. It's the, it's, it's what we would call shamanistic art. Um, it's no different. And speaking of shamanistic art, I, I I can't help but feel that we're seeing a lot more commonality throughout the different regions uh, with uh, symbols or postures or hand symbols. Um, is that is this because they were all communicating? What what is your your thought on that? You know, uh, I was in Holland recently. That's a very good question, Bernard. I was in Holland recently. I, I did all the. They have they have a strange monument there. It's almost like a long oval shaped um, barrow, if you want to call it that. And mostly, all that's left is the passageways. Uh, but the passageway is a side entrance, and it's got 
certain number of lunar counts. So there seem to be lunar counts and solar alignments, but um, these are typically dated to 3400 BC. Now, they're incredibly older than a lot of them. So most of the peak of the megalithic buildings are 2500 BC. So they attribute this stuff to the beaker culture, and they have a lot of beaker pottery. Uh, now, the, let's mention with the beaker, they, they have this type of pottery with zigzag wavy lines on it. Uh, it's typical of what we call beaker pottery. And, you know, I just wondered, did they just migrate from one region to the other, transmitting their knowledge? And we seem to have some evidence of that. But then we have evidence where they didn't migrate at all, Bernard, that you're looking at, you know, vast distances where the, the knowledge has been the same in both places. Uh, that, again, perpetuates a number of reasons why that would be. But, yeah, I mean, the shamans, they were all shamans, if you ask me. They were all shamans. Whoever used these monuments, they, they were all a shamanistic culture. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, at the heart, at the root of it, they were a shamanistic culture. Uh, there was hallucinogenic uh, material and plant products found in the bottom of some of these beakers as well. Uh, some of them were urns used for the cremations of the dead as well, so they would cremate in the bigger pots. Um, so there's different types of pottery found, but the pottery is indicative of the artwork too. And again, um, shamanism is the one that ties us all together. I, I can't help but put out my own little hypothesis here because I, sure. I, I I've heard, uh, and we and we hear about this so much, even with uh, you know neo shamans or neo pagans, that uh, when they transcend this uh, consciousness and and remove the veil, so to speak, everyone sees the same thing. And I I wonder if this has something to do with what their culture was doing. Their altered states maybe brought them. You know, of course, I'm speculating and hypothesizing, but. Uh, I wonder if there's a, if there's a, a commonality of the all, of the other side, so to speak, mm. and maybe well, that's what they were getting their inspiration from. <laughs> well, yeah, no, you're you're quite on the you're quite on the money there uh, with that one, Bernard. I mean, I think shamanism transcends all cultures and, and time. I mean, if it's a practice, whether people use hallucinogens or you know acoustics or starvation. Uh, rhythmic dance, uh, music, whatever, whatever type of method you want to get into an altered state, and 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 then shamanism is a is a cultured way of life built around that practice. Whatever that practice is, whatever your root there is, it, it it's a practice that transcends time. I mean, physical time. I mean, I don't mean it's a you're going back in time. I mean, it's like the people that would do that practice five thousand years ago and the people who do it today are doing the same practice. They're doing the same methods. It might be different, slightly altered methods from one region to another. But uh, I mean, the San people in, in uh, South Africa, they use uh, rhythmic dance. They dance around a fire until they pass out after 24 hours. Like, I mean, they do it the hard way. You know, they really do it the hard way. But regardless of what way they do it, they know that when they're in the altered state that they get enlightenment or they get knowledge given to them. And as a result, um, that is the heart of shamanism, that they're doing this for the purpose of gaining knowledge um, or some sort of a perspective to their own reality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, and to go back a little bit to the archivist, is it fair to say that uh, many of these megalithic cultures, if not all of them, had some type of understanding of the solar year as we were describing it with the equinoxes and the solstices and the cross quarter days? Were, were they all pretty much using it or aware of it? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, the, the, the one thing that you could probably say is that the, the solar year, um, I know that from my own measurements and calculations because I've been to four, maybe probably now, now about 500, 500 passage tombs, megalithic chambers all across Europe. And I've seen the same alignments. So you're talking about spring and, spring and autumn equinox, uh, summer and winter solstice. And then we have these halfway points in between what we call the, the, the other four cross quarter days. We seem to have those monuments all aligned as well. Um, and that seems to be, I've seen that down as far as Portugal, uh, Malta. Uh, you'll always get an equinox and you'll always get a solstice alignment uh, at these temples. But you have these strange ones where, you know, it's the one thing that ties it together, just the eight segmented solar wheel. And I think that was a, we even have that on gold brooches, Bernard, going back to 2500 BC. I, I just literally witnessed one in the Ashmolem Museum uh, in Oxford um, from Ireland. Uh, Believe it or not, some people went looking for a giant's grave 
uh, a few hundred years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the location of which has now been lost uh, from the records. But they went looking, dug it all up, smashed it to pieces, and inside it they found this a gold uh, shield, a gold brooch, um, with the solar wheel on it. Um, and the solar wheel has been known across Samaria, Assyria, all across the, the Babylonian region too. It's 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 scattered everywhere. The idea of this solar wheel. Um, the British Museum has got another solar wheel from Ireland as well. It seems to be this was a, a, a always in gold. I mean, th this idea of the solar wheel seems to be scattered across all cultures. Yeah, it seems to be. It seems to be. I, I find it fascinating. It's kind of like a, a common. It's like looking at the sun and saying what time it is by looking at the sun. This is a, a, a very universal way of saying you know what time time of year it is. Absolutely. Another, uh, just to wrap up thing too, Bernard, is, I mean, another, another fascinating thing I want to bring attention to is yes. these, uh, these carved stone balls. There's, there's Neolithic carved stone balls uh, found in northeast Scotland and uh, northeast uh, Ireland as well, Antrim as well, but predominantly most of them are in, from uh, Scottish origin. And they're Neolithic, they're associated, they're found near the monuments. Uh, they're showing incredibly sophisticated geometry um there you're looking at the platonic solids for example again they're in the ashmolean museum in, in oxford and if you put in carved stone ball into google you'll, you'll find the wikipedia page there's got spirals there they've got incredible artwork on them plus they have uh, they almost look like size of tennis balls and they show seem to be showing directional fields uh, they, 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 like their teaching models or teaching aids, they show an incredibly complex uh, system. It, it, some of this stuff is, it looks like you know, high-tech teaching aids made out of stone, and the stones that they're made out of are, are multi-faceted, uh, different materials. Um, and like I say, to, to show the platonic solids uh, from the Neolithic period shows an incredible sophistication in geometry. Uh, that is the building block of all engineering. If you do not have the platonic solids or, or a knowledge of, you will not have complex geometry. I mean, you look at these glass ceilings in, in, in buildings that are linked together with trusses and stuff. I mean, you need the knowledge of the platonic solids for that, how many trusses you need, and the triangle is the, is the best uh, structural support you can get, and how many triangles you put in to make a pentagon and hexagon and all this stuff. It's, it's all platonic solids. Um, you know, and this is the stuff that's found in the Neolithic record. You know, pyramids, uh, octahedrons, dodecahedrons, icosahedrons. It's all there in Neolithic wow. times. And nobody seems to address this. I mean, most of this carved Neolithic stone balls are in Aberdeen University under lock and key, not publicly available. And uh, it's not on display. I asked to see the, 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 the platonic solids in the Ashmola Museum. I had to put in a, a record. I'm still waiting on them to reply to me. They haven't even replied to me. They're not for public display. And there is a few there, there are a few there, but they put the really simpler looking ones on display. Right. And the ones that are really, there's some in the British Museum as well, there's only three there. Uh, but they're scattered all across Britain. I mean, uh, there's two different museums in Glasgow has them as well. And uh, it is ironic, and I'm going, out here, I'm going out on the limit this one, but if you drew a magnetic model of the sun, you would have a six pole system. You would have a north pole, a south pole, and four poles around the equator, of plus minus, plus minus. Uh, so if you can picture a plus and minus uh, north, po north pole, south pole, and a plus minus, plus minus around the equator, you'd have a six pole system. Um, and these, a lot of these teaching models seem to be showing a six pole spherical ball. And not only that, where you would see each pole, you'll have the lines going one way, horizontal, and then the next lines will be going vertical, and then the next line going horizontal, as if to show directional fields. And in between the horizontal and vertical lines, there's arrows showing you flow currents as well. And if you were to make an actual, actual representation of the magnetic poles of the sun, that would be a perfect representation of it. Is that a coincidence? I'm not saying these guys knew this knowledge, I'm just saying it is what it is, and is an actual representation. Uh, for all better purposes of the magnetic poles of the sun. Um, how could they know that? I'll leave that one open to the viewers because that's not for me to conclude. Uh, it's me just to show the evidence and, and provide it for people. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, and, and just the pull, amazing pull, fact they can do this all. Yeah, but pull up, uh, I mean, if any listeners are out there, pull up carved stone balls uh, or Neolithic carved stone balls into Google, and you'll see some of these shapes that these guys had. I mean, these guys were onto something, and it's it's largely unaddressed. It really is. 
uh, we've only we've only got like two more minutes, but I just wonder if um, if you have a comment on this latest uh, discovery that's being released out in the news right now. Uh, they found Stonehenge found under Lake Michigan, and they have found carvings of pachyderms and all kinds mm -hmm. of very interesting. Uh these articles get regurgitated. That one's out quite a while, Bernard. I was well oh. aware of that. They're, yeah, because uh, divers found that not too long ago. But they may have gone back again for a second run. I, uh, um, they've gone yeah. back in with um, some type of like sonar or something to map it out, it seems. Yeah, no, I'm definitely aware of that one. That's incredibly interesting. Uh, I was looking at underwater structures for the megalithic. There's another stone circle off the coast of Scotland, 10 meters under the water. Uh, that again, it was resurfaced on an article a couple of years ago and hasn't been here of since. But um, yeah, that's incredibly interesting that Michigan one, because right. <laughs> um, I have friends in Michigan. They're looking into that for me, but I never heard much after that. Right. Um, why it's there? I mean, you're talking it, that could be before the ice age, for all we know. I don't know when the last time those depths of Lake Michigan was down that low to, to, for that to be built. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. Years and years. Anyway, well, we are out of time, James. I can't believe this hour has gone by so quickly. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And again, any last words or any last um, information well, you yeah. can offer? Yeah, I'm going to be co-hosting the Megalithic documentary. That's called Megalithic Odyssey, uh, God's Myths and Men. That's going to be coming out uh, as soon as I can roll it out. I might even start partially releasing some episodes. But uh, Maria Wheatley will be doing the English presenting and Thomas Sheridan will be doing the Irish presenting. And I know Maria Wheatley's... Uh, uh, due for a show. She's got some really sophisticated uh, uh, information to come out and change the paradigm of archaeology. Uh, it really is. Whether people are going to like it or not, it's going to change. So. Very good. Well, thank you so but much. Jameswagger.com. 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 Absolutely. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening.